Welcome, everyone. I'm Amanda Williams, and I'm here today with Jim Zobel, the MacArthur Memorial Archivist, and we have a really interesting topic for today. In his autobiography, General MacArthur summed up the World War II island hopping strategy with a quote from baseball legend Willie Keeler, hit them where they ain't. Now, this wasn't just a convenient, really pithy quote for MacArthur. Football might have been his great love, but baseball was a close runner up for him. And from playing in the first Army-Navy baseball game as a young cadet to holding special American and National League um, Major League Baseball passes in the 1950s that gave him basically the best seat in the house at any Major League Baseball game. Baseball was a consistent part of his life. And today we're going to talk about MacArthur and baseball. So Jim, at 6'1", about 140 pounds, MacArthur is too small to be a football player at West Point, but that's not an issue when it comes to playing baseball. So walk us through his collegiate career, and does he play baseball for four years at West Point? He was, he was 5'11", I think, but yeah, still way too small, you know, for, for playing football. I think a guy had been killed in an Army Harvard game you know, like uh, uh, not too far in the distant past from like 1901. So, I mean, it was a bruising sport. They didn't wear any pads, you know, like a leather hat, and whatnot. So he's definitely too small for that. But no, he doesn't play anything his, his uh, freshman year. Uh, and, you know, he had played football and played baseball when he was at West Texas Military Academy. And the thing is second year he goes out for the baseball team and he does get to a position on the team and he's the left fielder and he's part of the you know the army nine and you can go through they still have a lot of those um newspaper websites that you can find you know all the clippings about the games and you can see where macarthur played you know left field and if he got hits or bases on balls and things like that i think there's only a few of the original box scores left but he plays that season and then uh comes back the next year but he seemed he plays right field that year and he seems to ride the bench more i think he has a couple of times where he comes in as a runner and then he doesn't even um, he's not even on the roster for, I think, the last game or something like that. So definitely a difference between that first, that second and third year at West Point between how much he plays. And then the fourth year, he doesn't play at all. And a lot of people have speculated that was because he was first captain. Corps cadets had all these other duties. Um, a lot of people say that he uh, was focused more on, you know, scholastics and wanting to be the, the number one cadet at West Point. But um, so other people have brought up a, a good point that uh, the coach of West Point football at that time was a guy named Charles Irvine. And he was like a former uh, Kansas City player from the Western Leagues uh, during that time. And, and he had been picked by a guy named George Irving, who played for the, the New York Giants as well. And they were, you know, like the coaches of Army. And MacArthur was pretty close to this guy, and he didn't come back that senior year. And so some people wonder, you know, did that have an effect? But we we don't really know. We just know that, you know, he plays those those first two years and, and you know, we'll look back on it as, as, you know, some of the happiest times of his life. And, he you know, he, he gets that A for Army baseball, and, and he worships that, you know, he, he – has that bathrobe with the Army A all the way through the rest of his life where, you know, he's, he's constantly got this thing on and people remark about it. So I think he, he definitely thought that was, you know, probably better than any medal he ever, you know, was right. awarded was what, what he got from, from playing varsity baseball, you know, at, at West Point. Yeah, you're right. It seems like he always has that baseball letter, whether it's a sweater or a bathrobe, he's got mm -hmm. that baseball letter. So very, yeah. very proud of his his baseball experience. Well, I can't it's believe big, I got it's a big thing. You know, I it's can't a big believe... thing for any athlete, you know, in college is to is to is to letter, you know. Right. I can't believe I got his height wrong. 5'11. No, that's all right. <laughs> that's one of the easier you know, facts. Okay. That's kind of like what, what Mountbatten said, you know, when he saw him in his office, he looked like diminutive and small, but 
when they left the office and he had that hat on, he looked like he was seven feet tall and could crush anybody. Right. He could contact with. Yeah. And I think I'm thinking of the, some photographs of him maybe standing with Kenny or someone where he looks like a giant. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Sorry. Sorry. Kenny's everybody. like five, four. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So back to baseball. Um, there is one game in particular that I want to focus on, and that is the first Army Navy baseball game, um, May 18th, 1901. MacArthur mentions this game in his autobiography, and he gets heckled quite a bit, and it's really kind of hilarious. Um, but it must have still been an absolutely thrilling day for him. So tell us about this particular game. Well, the, the I think the best thing that the cadets like was that they finally got off campus. I mean, when you were on a baseball or a football team and you got to travel with the team, that was like leaving the prison, you know, cause you didn't, you never left the monastery on the Hudson. Um, so they looked at it as a, you know, a special thing getting to go away. They took the train down to Baltimore and they, I think they stayed there on the 17th. And then uh, they took the train the next morning to Annapolis and, uh, Ed Hamner, who was the coach of Navy, he meets them there at the at the station and and takes them out to the field where they're going to play at Annapolis. And they get there and there's like 3000 people there, you know, ready, ready for this thing to go off because it is it's the first Army Navy baseball game. And they had they had just recently restarted the Army Navy football game because remember they closed that down because it caused so much strife between the two colleges and everybody got all violent and everything so they had finally started that but this is the big one and so it's going to be a game that starts at like 2 30 and it rains you know the whole time but nobody leaves and MacArthur will remember that he scored the winning run of the game and all these other people will say MacArthur scored the winning run of the game well he didn't actually do that he scored one of the runs but army are back in those days the home team went to bat first so they had like a 15 minute warm-up and then they started the game so navy goes up first and then at the top of the third they scored a run and then in the bottom of the third army gets up and this navy pitcher wade roar bash or something like that well he he nails the first guy you know and puts him on uh, base and then uh the second guy comes up and he hits him right in the face <laughs> with the ball. And so you've already got two guys on base. And then MacArthur comes out and uh, he walks, you know, on base. And so then they've got the full bases. Another guy comes up, hits a sacrifice, and there's a wild pitch. So two runs score. MacArthur's now, you know, on third. And this guy, John Hur, who will later go on to be the chief of cavalry for the U.S. Army in like 1938, he comes up and knocks MacArthur in. So that's three runs in that bottom of the third inning and uh so it's three to one they say later on uh Stephen Abbott who's a 1902 classman will be knocked in by Hackett so that's four runs which will be the lead run because uh Navy comes back at the end of the game and they score two runs in that top of the ninth but they can't um win the game you know and then afterwards you know it's just bedlam but yeah MacArthur goes there his dad's the top general in the Philippines he's the military governor and they just start razzing him non-stop you know they pick him out to just uh you know give him all all the raspberries they can you know <laughs> for that for that whole game but he he stands up pretty well and and you know he scores that run and he says it's the, you know, he'll always say all these different instances are, are the happiest days of his life. But you got to think that that is, you know, to score in the first Army Navy game. And and um, MacArthur, he'll he'll come back and he'll play in the second game. You know, even though he doesn't have the um, the he's not like the starter. He starts in that second game in 1902 as well. They lose that game. But but he does, you know, he does get to start in, in right field for that game. One thing that struck me about him as a player, at least from what you can see from the stats, is that he's very daring. You know, he's somebody who's trying to steal a base, you know, and I feel like in, in baseball today, it's more about, okay, let's get on base the safest way possible and kind of what, you know, no, nothing too daring, not a lot of like base stealing, but it seems like that was something that he really liked doing. And that kind of leads me to the next question. When you read about um, his performance, similar to his time in high school, 
people that were there with him tend to talk about him being somebody who grinds out a performance, mm. um, someone who, you know, through sheer pluck and will tries to get it done. Um, a smart, if not maybe gifted athlete in every way. Um, so here's my very important question. Was he any good overall as a baseball player? Well, he was good. You know, he was good enough to get on the team for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that first year into play. And, um, I, you know, I, I, even though he rode the bench pretty much the second year, you know, he was still good enough to be there. Stephen Abbott, you know, that guy that, um, we talked about in, in the first game, he said, just what you said, that MacArthur had this ability to get on base. You know, he wasn't a big hitter. He could bunt good. Um, he would work it out. He would get base on balls. And Abbott was like, you know, it, it wasn't like he was the big power hitter, but he always ended up on base. And that's what you want in baseball. And so they, you know, that was looked upon as, as, as a plus for him. Um, but Bob Seals, uh, who has done a lot of work on MacArthur and baseball at West Point, um, worked it out because he had like a lot of the box scores. And he said MacArthur had the worst fielding percentage of, you know, the team. And he was batting maybe like 266 when everybody else was batting at least like 300 or 310. So, okay. you know, he, he wasn't, you know, any any great player, but it's it's like you said, you know, he was, he was able to work it out. You know, it was interesting because uh, when he comes home in – in 51, uh, he gets a telegram on May 18th, and it's from Stephen Abbott, you know, and it's 50 years to the day afterward, and Abbott says, I bet you still look back on that game as, you know, one of the greatest, and MacArthur, you know, got back to him, said, still, you know, the happiest day of my life, you know, practically, so um, it was something that, that both of them, you know, definitely remembered for the rest of their lives, and, and Abbott, you know, because it's like you said, a lot of people even look back and said, yeah, MacArthur won that game or MacArthur was really great. You know, he was smart player and all this stuff, but Abbott put it, you know, probably adeptly, you know, you didn't understand how he got on base, but somehow, right. he, somehow he was always <laughs> able to get on base. Yeah. So moving forward during world war one, um, baseball is a big part of the lives of American soldiers, especially overseas. And, um, baseball is an encouraged activity. Um, and a lot of work went into making sure the troops had the equipment to play baseball in their spare time. Um, given his interest in the sport and in athletics in general, was MacArthur one of the officers kind of helping to facilitate um, baseball for the Doughboys or, um, mm. you know, do we know if he played at all when yeah. he's overseas? I don't, you know, we know that he plays when he goes to Leavenworth. They have that, that officer's team there from like 08 to 11 and MacArthur plays all three years. And, and so we know he's playing at that point in his life, you know, when he's 28, 29, you know, 30 years old, maybe. Um, but you get to World War I, we've seen in the Rainbow Division, some of those units, they have teams, you know, they're outfitted in uniforms and they've got, you know, all got mitts and everything. Um, MacArthur loves baseball, so you don't see why he wouldn't be, you know, uh, sponsoring it or in support of, of, of people playing it. But there's that one letter from June of 51 that we found in the collection. And it's from a guy named Earl Sarka. And he was a 1917 graduate of West Point. And he said that stationed in Le Mans, they had these inter-unit uh, games that they would have uh, from the American Expeditionary Force. And this is during the occupation of Germany. And he wrote MacArthur saying he remembered MacArthur pitching a couple of innings wow. um, during this game near Le Mans. And you think about it and you're like, well... But the guy Sarka goes to West Point, you know, he, he's got to know who MacArthur is. And so, I, I, you know, you don't, it's, you know, 30 years later, but you think that that might be something that would stick out in his mind. So um, you kind of look at it and you're like, well, well, maybe, you know, maybe he did just go up there and, you know, play, play, play a little bit of ball, you know. I mean, at that time, he's, he's still only 38, 39, you know, he's not, he's not a ancient or anything. Mm -hmm. I can imagine him as a pitcher. Mm. So. Or maybe trying, trying very to hard. <laughs> maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe not doing so well, but yeah. giving it his all-time best, that's for sure. 
Yeah. Although it might be kind of awkward here. You have the colonel or brigadier general at that time as the pitcher. Interesting. Or maybe yeah. he wouldn't have played so that everybody could kind of enjoy playing without the general. Being yeah. Who knows? yeah. Who knows? You know, I mean, you know, having all that material lost, you know, in uh, MacArthur's, you know, collection, you just, you don't know, you know, we, it's, it's a question mark. Right. All right. Then moving forward again, as superintendent of West Point after World War I, um, I think we can say arguably he's the father of modern athletics at, at West Point. Um, we hear a lot about his relationship with the football team during his time mm -hmm. as superintendent, but what about the baseball team? Yeah, same thing. I think uh, MacArthur, you know, comes back from that World War I uh, experience and believes that every Army person has to be an athlete, you know, to, to make it in the conditions of modern warfare. And so he'll start that intramural program at West Point. Every uh, cadet plays a sport. Uh, and you're right, he does, you know, foster that football team, but he does so with the baseball team as well. I think that Earl or Hope, Earl Hobart or something like that was the coach at that time. And he would meet with MacArthur all the time, you know, about, about the season coming up. MacArthur would go to practices. Uh, Red Blake, who became a coach of Army football, would always tell the story about uh, Blake was having trouble hitting the curveball. And MacArthur was watching him, you know, trying to give him pointers. And, and then MacArthur was like, let me show you how, you know, loosened his collar and took off his jacket and could hit, couldn't hit the ball, you know, at all. <laughs> after, after many tries at trying to do it. And, and Blake said that after that, he couldn't hit, you know, a curveball and he couldn't hit a straight ball at all, you know, for about a week because he had been so screwed up by MacArthur's advice. <laughs> and so that's why I say about the, the pitch thing maybe he thought he could pitch you know real well but but who knows if he really could because uh, Blake said it was probably the only thing that MacArthur ever tried to do that he couldn't do you know at that time which was was hit the ball so it, but it shows that MacArthur is there at practices is you know very much on on top of the team and, and believes that uh it is something that you know is is more than worthwhile and it's a sport he loves you know and and I think that that shows it more than anything you know that getting to be, you know, I, I still want to play, you know, I'm 41, 42, I, I can still do this. So, yeah. All right. But, you know, during that, that, you know, the other thing during that was, you know, this guy, um, Al Stump wrote this book about Ty Cobb. And he wrote in there that during MacArthur's uh, West Point years as superintendent, he would go hang out with Ty Cobb in the city. Really, now we know Mac we, we know MacArthur. Well, the thing is, is you don't know though because other things have come up, you know, just that we have here. But uh, we know MacArthur would go down to the polo grounds, and the mayor of New York City would invite him down. You know, let's get the superintendent down. He would go down for those games. But Ty Cobb wrote MacArthur this letter that we found here um, in 1952, and MacArthur had made a statement that uh, Ty Cobb was the greatest baseball player because of his offensive strategy that and just you know like in baseball the competition of baseball like in war defensive strategy has never led to uh, ultimate victory as an outcome and Ty heard this comment and he wrote MacArthur this letter you know right afterward and it but it's like they don't know each other okay. you know and Ty Cobb is saying to him you know I you know, just effusive praise, something you wouldn't expect to come from Ty Cobb at all, you know, kind of a uh, mushy in a way. And so it, but it doesn't, he doesn't reflect on, you know, you know, a friendship or them knowing each other. So that's why I wonder about, you know, the Al Stump comments about Cobb in that book. And a lot of people have pointed out there's, a, you know, a lot of problems with that book. But um, after that, I think MacArthur and, and, you know, after that 52 letter, I think MacArthur and Cobb do become friends because MacArthur will write the introduction for, for Cobb's biography. And uh, I, I know that Cobb will, will say that he goes to visit MacArthur at the Waldorf, you know, in those last few years. So I think, I don't think so much as during the superintendent haze period he is, but I, I think later on, and, and that's the thing, you know, about the 20s and 30s, you know, because everything was destroyed, you know, does he know all these people? Does, is he hanging out with these people? 
you know, because nobody's really writing him later, you know, at least in the 19, you know, 40 during the war, you know, 50s when he comes home, everybody's writing it, but, you know, not then. Hmm. All right. Um, as his career progresses after his, his time at West Point, um, he's not playing baseball anymore himself, or he's not yeah. kind of trying to help coach other people at this point. Are there any other stories, though? I mean, you mentioned most of the records from this period are missing, but does yeah. he have contact with ball players in the 30s or 40s? Um, well, we we know that there are those. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of ball players, professional ball players, playing in or fighting with the Southwest Pacific Forces. We know they have a big game um, in Manila after Manila's retaken in '45, and. Uh, and they have this big game with all these former pro players that, you know, are, are now in the Army or the Air Force or, or the Navy. There's also uh, leagues that are in Australia that MacArthur supports. They have a MacArthur Trophy in Australia that all the teams buy for. Um, but I found a letter the other day, uh, Albert Chandler, Happy Chandler, you know, who was the commissioner, said he came and visited MacArthur in New Guinea, you know, at Port really? Moresby. Yeah, and and said that MacArthur did not mention baseball at all. You know, it was all the war. There was no, you know, light talk about old days baseball, anything like that. It was because Chandler was, you know, a, what, a congressman or a senator or something like that, you know, at the, at the same time. And so he was out there on like a fact-finding tour and it was, it was all military because that, you know, M M MacArthur had no, no mind for anything else at that point. But we, we know that there are all these, you know, baseball games going on. There are baseball being played during that time. He supports the, the trophy being named the MacArthur Trophy. But, and it's like kind of like Barbie, uh, Dan Barbie, the, you know, the, the admiral said that um, anytime he saw MacArthur, there was no small talk. It was, all the, it was all the war. It was all military. It was, you know, everything's geared towards that. There was, there was no talk of any kind of recreation. Know, type mm. activities or any anything like that changes when he gets to japan but yeah right right and i guess there's a few official statements he makes about sports i mean i guess he's in line with roosevelt in 1941-42 when they're saying we should keep having sport in america during the war we shouldn't yeah. cancel the seasons and then i guess in what 44 when the west point football team beats navy he sends them that congratulatory telegram. But I think right, you're right. Like right. personally, there's no, he's not really paying attention. I think for the first time in his life, there's like this period where he is so consumed with the war that he's not paying attention to the scores, yeah, what's happening. Well, from, from what everybody says, yeah. You know, from anybody that knew him, you know. Yeah. Um, and these, these people all knew him pretty well. And, and they said that was just, you know, everything he was focused on during that time, you know, at mm -hmm. least understandable sure yeah. um moving into the occupation we see photographs of gene MacArthur throwing out you know first pitch in japan um but we don't see photographs of MacArthur there in those stadiums we don't see him throwing out first pitches um baseball in japan clearly has his blessing though um and so what is he doing behind the scenes of the occupation to can kind of encourage the resumption of baseball in Japan? Well, he believed that uh, sports were a, a rallying point for Japan, that they were, it was a great moral force for Japan. You know, that's why he really wants to get a Japanese Olympic team um, back in it. So that, because he believed that, you know, Japan had been destroyed culturally as well as militarily. Uh, and there was that vacuum and they needed something to look towards to be like a national honor, you know, again. And he believed sports was, was the way to do that. Baseball, he was very supportive of. Uh, Japan had a long history with baseball. Uh, he, when um, in 1948, I believe it was, Waseda University played, I think it's called Kyo University, and they had played the first championship between colleges back in 1903 when MacArthur graduated. So he issued this big statement, you know, about baseball, you know, being this uh, rallying more moral force. And, and I think he really believed that. Again, he still believed in it for the, for the troops because they have a very 
well-organized baseball leagues for all the Air Force, Marines, Navy, uh, Army teams that are all throughout Japan, and they'll travel all throughout and play during that 45-51 period. But in 48, Howard Handelman is a reporter for U.S. News and World Report, and he comes to MacArthur with this idea uh, from the National Baseball Congress. And this was a like a, an amateur uh, baseball league that had been formed in Kansas by the, uh, this guy named Damon in like 35. And they would have, they, and I think they're still in existence actually, and they would have uh, like World Series of amateur baseball in Wichita every year and still do. And Handelman comes and he says, why don't you have the winner of that team come to Japan and they'll play the Japanese teams, you know, over here. And MacArthur was very uh, responsive to that, like that idea. And so from 48, 49, 50, 51, they would have the champion of this uh, league uh, come over and play of the National Baseball Congress and they come and play Japan. And MacArthur had his uh, um, natural resources commander, Major General William Marquette. And Marquette had been his, one of the Batang gang, hauled off uh, Corregidor on the PT boats, was like the, a, the any aircraft officer uh, for Southwest Pacific area. And he starts running baseball in Japan. And our great spy of World War II, Chick Parsons, he'll be the commissioner of the National Baseball Congress in the Philippines. And so they start putting together all these inter um, uh, nation um, playing of teams, as well as all these trips, uh, Lefty O'Doul, Joe DiMaggio will come to Japan and the San Francisco Seals will play team, Japanese teams and American teams throughout. And this is a really big deal because it's it gets you know tens and tens of thousands of Japanese out to the stadium. Baseball really explodes in Japan, and so you could say that it's you know it's fostered all by MacArthur, you know, because he agrees to all this, and and they would put him in that National Baseball Congress uh, flyer, you know, every year. Um, this is the guy, you know, who's who's allowing all this to happen. There would be a lot of teams that would want to come to Japan. But they would have to say, no, we don't have the finances. You know, the only thing that they would have would be this National Baseball Congress, you know, that would come there. And so he was very much a big, big sponsor of, of uh, Japanese baseball as well as international uh, baseball you know, all during that Japan period. After he's relieved by Truman in 1951, he comes back to the States and a very interesting report emerges in the press, and that's that Major League Baseball is looking for a new commissioner, and they want MacArthur. And he says no. Uh, why do we think that he turns down the top job in baseball? He comes back, and almost immediately, you know, all these newspapers, it's pictures of him in the baseball stadiums, you know, and he says, the first play thing I want to do is see a ball game. Arthur MacArthur, as soon as he lands in San Francisco, the Oakland team is like, come to a game tonight. You know, the night before they leave to go to Washington for the, you know, old soldiers never die speech. And so it starts immediately. And uh, Arthur gets his picture in the paper with uh, the Yankees and they're giving him a jacket and a baseball hat. And then immediately Arthur has thousands of kids writing him, I like baseball too, you know, <laughs> as well. Like you said, all of a sudden MacArthur's name starts getting bandied around as he's going to be the next baseball commissioner. Well, there's uh, MacArthur always said, I have no you know, desire to be the baseball commissioner. And all the other candidates who were up for baseball, they all write MacArthur, man, if you're getting in this, I'm getting out because I don't <laughs> want any, any part of this, you know? And MacArthur would write them all, no, this is just something everybody's making up. You know, I have I have no, no idea of doing this at all. You know, he's got that uh, speaking tour he's gonna be doing. Um, it, those dates are all set as well. He's gonna take that job with Remington Rand. But also, you know, we, as we were talking, you had a really good idea about why not he's not taking that job. Because he's thinking about the White House. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 I think and so. You, and you don't want to lock yourself down with that when you're mm -hmm. running for president. You know? No. Because he's going to give that speech at the Republican National Convention, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I tend to agree with you, you know, that 
and even though they were offering you know him that you know and something he probably would have liked to do maybe later on but you know not yeah. so much then and then like after that you know his, his health really starts going down but when they you know when they have all those pictures in the paper immediately everybody's there's at least 11 letters to come throw out the first pitch you know at this game uh the the African American, you know, the ne the old Negro League, as they called it back then, they want him to come out and throw the first pitch at the at the you know game in Chicago, uh, as well. The uh, All American Girls League, they want him to come throw out the first pitch at their thing. Uh, they've got everybody wanting him to come dedicate a new stadium, the MacArthur Stadium in Syracuse. You, you have a, a a pass to come here whenever you want to. And if he had accepted all these things, he would have been throwing out baseballs and inaugurating stadium <laughs> for at least the first three years of his time, yeah. you know, back in the States. Because every, you know, and it's even, we have a new little league uh, stadium in Passaic, New Jersey. Come dedicate this. And he would always be like, oh, thank you so much. I would love to be there, but going to be out of town, you know, at that time. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, everybody just goes, goes crazy on him and and um all these other baseball players will start writing him again you know like we said like Tris Speaker and and um and Ty Cobb and DiMaggio and and all of them so well that brings and we me have those family. pictures of him with Jackie Robinson you know and right. and uh and Bert Campanella you know which is just crazy so you know so we have a lot of amazing artifacts here at the MacArthur Memorial, but I think the baseball collection is probably one of my favorites here. Um, it includes obviously items related to baseball in Japan and stadiums in Japan, um, a lot of baseballs, baseball signed by Tris Speaker, Babe Ruth, you mentioned Ty Cobb. Yeah. Um, we also have these special annual passes that allowed him and his party to have excellent seats at any national or American league game. Did he use those passes? I mean, we talked about him going to a game and meeting Jackie Robinson. I mean, yeah. is he going to games very often or does he kind of fade away after that initial first year back? We know that in, after, you know, the Fuhrer died, um, not the Fuhrer, but, you know, right. the, uh, the, you know the, the intensity of the season, the excitement of the season died out. He went to a game. And they introduced him, you know, and everybody clapped and everything. But then, so you know, one of the fans yelled out, hey, Mac, how's Harry Truman? And everybody laughed at him. You know, it was like just uproar. Right. And so I, you wonder, like, does that make him be like, oh, that uh, mustard has just come off the hot dog. Yeah. But, yeah, we know that, he, you know, he'll go to games. But I think that, you know, he gets very sick. He gets – it's hard for him to move around. And he can watch them all on TV because, you know, it's all day games. They broadcast them all on TV, the, the Giants games, the Dodgers games, the Yankees game, which are all there. We know he likes going to the polo grounds. But, yes, they send him those season passes where you can go to any stadium, any game, any day and get a first class seat. No, I'm no matter where you, I mean, this is like the most awesome gold pass. They would send it to him for the American League as well as the National League. And then they'd send him a pass to come into uh, the polo grounds and sit wherever he wants or Yankee Stadium and sit wherever he wants. So it's, it's good to be the king. You know, you get <laughs> a lot of perks that go along with it. But the, the passes to me, they, they would every year, here's your. Here's your league pass for, for this year. That's a good gig, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did he have a favorite team? I don't know if he ever picked. It seemed like he would go see the, the Giants more right. than anything, the, New York, the old New York Giants. I just didn't know if that um, was just because it was more convenient in terms of location or if he really had like probably, a affinity. Yeah, uh, which, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, not being in New York, I don't know where the polo grounds were. You know, they might have been closer to the Waldorf than than because the Yankee Stadium is in the Bronx. You know, I think, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know where the polo grounds were. But I and and it seems like more of the pictures that we have are are him there rather right. than at, at Yankee Stadium. You know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any final thoughts on MacArthur and baseball? No, it's cool having all the stuff. It's cool seeing, you know, all the things that that pop out. Like I didn't know we had that 
Ty Cobb letter. And that's, that's just incredible. Um, you know, just cause it, it, it really counters a lot of that Al Stump book as well as uh, a lot of the thoughts about Cobb cause he comes off being kind of sentimental, you know, in that letter. That's, that's not what you expect from, from Ty Cobb. You know? Right. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, Welcome back, Amanda. Thank you. Um, for more about the MacArthur Memorial or for more information about upcoming events or these discussions that Jim and I have, um, visit www.macarthurmemorial.org and we will see you again soon. <laughs>